Hey guys, welcome to California Carnivores, the largest, most famous carnivorous plant nursery in the United States. I'm Damon Collingsworth, and I get to be the owner and general manager of this magical place every single day. Today, I'm gonna to teach you about how to grow Venus flytraps. I know it seems crazy, because as we all know, Venus flytraps are easy to kill. The truth is, they actually wanna live, and they can be easy to care for, with a couple little tweaks on normal plant care. I myself got my first Venus fly traps when I was around 12 years old, and I still have those same ones, which makes them 30 year old Venus fly traps. It dates me a little bit. But I can teach you how to do the exact same thing. And we're gonna do that today in this ultimate Venus fly trap care guide. My business partner, Peter D'Amato, wrote the ultimate care guide on growing carnivorous plants years ago, The Savage Garden. It's the award-winning, best-selling manual on growing them, and it's been in print all the way since 1998. I'm here to share the same information with you guys in a more visual, modern way, but we're gonna capture the genius of this book, which is, it's beautifully written with flowery prose, like only Peter can write, but if you're sick of that, at the end of every chapter, and there's a chapter on every genus of carnivorous plants, so at the end of every chapter, there are these green pages. These famous green pages have taught more people to grow carnivorous plants than probably anything else. And it's very easy to reference. We have climate, soil, and we're gonna do this video the exact same way. We've had my flowery pros already, but on free, here on out, we're gonna timestamp every single section. So if you're sick of hearing me talk, you can skip straight to watering, dormancy, or whatever answers you're out to get. The Venus flytrap is probably the most famous plant in the entire world because of its amazing quick movement and catching insects. But unfortunately, for as many of you who already know about them, almost nobody really knows how to grow them well. And we're here to change that today. Part of the problem is everybody thinks when I ask people, where did these come from? Some, some smart aleck will always say space, like Venus, a lot of guesses about Africa or the Amazon, some sweltering jungle, some far off exotic place. That's not true. It would surprise almost all of you to know that Venus flytraps are actually native to the bogs and swamps in North and South Carolina. And they've grown there only for millions of years. Because they grow in wetlands, they are very endangered actually. We'll probably see them go extinct in my lifetime. You probably don't realize it because we just don't think very much about wetlands, but as soon as Europeans got here to the US, we started destroying them. Swamps and bogs and wet areas have long been regarded as garbage land. And in fact, in the mid 1800s, they, pa they passed the um, Wetlands Reclamation Act, which you would think would be about saving wetlands based on our current standing on ecosystems, but was actually all about draining swamps and turning it into valuable farmland. And when we did that, we got rid of almost all the Venus flytraps. And so that's why it's really important to keep them growing in cultivation. And there are lots of them in cultivation, like this beautiful specimen here. So the first step to growing any plant from us, and if you're smart, you did order it from us. Not only are we super reputable, and also, I care about this because I've done it for 30 years and the little 11 year old me would die inside if I sent you a bad plant. We always take care of anybody if there's any shipping problems as well. So it's good to buy from a nice reputable dealer like California Carnivores. But we do have to get it out of the packaging it came in. But getting it out of our carefully packed packaging can be a little bit tricky. And so it's smart to show you guys how to do it. You're gonna want a sharp knife, a scalpel if you have it, a box cutter, something like this. The cup has been sealed down on top of it like that. And the best thing to do for starters is take your blade and put it in between the cup and the top of the pot. And I'm just gonna turn it around and cut that. Watch out for your tag, so I'll want that for later. There we go. Let's see, give it a little twist. Oh, there's my Venus flytrap. 
Now, this is not a humidity dome. This isn't made to stay on there forever. You wanna take that off as soon as you get it. And likewise, if you bought your plant at a hardware store, you're rescuing one from a Home Depot or something like that, and it is a rescue, because those poor guys are usually not set up for success, take it out of that clear cylinder it came in. They don't want that at all, um, so get it out of that right away. Probably just cook it and make it hard to care for. So I got this cup off of there. That's just to protect the crown of the plant. And you can see, it still looks pretty good. All the traps have closed. It'd be impossible to get you a Venus flytrap and guarantee that all the traps would be open if you like shipping set mouse traps. It's just not gonna happen. Um, and plants are never made to move. A plant is made to grow in its same spot that it germinated its entire life and live and die in that one spot. It's never, ever, ever made to take a 50 mile voyage, you know, somewhere else. It's definitely not made to go to the East Coast in a dark box. So there will be some transition shock. It's totally fine, it's totally normal. We've been shipping these plants for 30 years and we have a lot of success in that and a lot of successful customers too. So don't worry about some initial shock. Um, carnivorous plants can have some high leaf turnover anyways. Each leaf can only close two or three times. And so if it's closed on its last time while it was in the box, that's gonna turn black and that's totally fine. And because their leaves are digesting and doing something more than normal leaves, they do transition through quickly. But there's a little bulb in there that is the life of the plant. Just like a daffodil, it really doesn't hardly matter what happens to the top of it as long as that bulb stays safe and sound. Now, if you order from one of our competitors, it's really likely that this poor plant can bear root. It'll save you on shipping, but cost you months, if even years in time. Because we're shipping in pots, which is something that we started like 30 years ago and we've prided ourselves on shipping in pots, we've been able to build this hobby by getting people plants with good momentum. Beginners can get a plant that way. If you're ordering bare root, that's really only for experts. You have to know what soil to put it in. You have to track that down. There's a lot that could go wrong and there'll be a lot more shock because that bulb has been dug up, thrown in a bag, and you're gonna see um, a lot more brown leaves and it might take months for it to come back. And if you order that plant like uh, late summer or in the fall, you won't get any growth at all. It's just gonna go dormant because of the shock and it's gonna come back next spring. So if you're new to this, buy a potted plant. That will do so much better for everyone. The cup is off. The next step is we've wrapped saran wrap tightly around the crown of the plant to hold the soil down so it doesn't fall out. So I'm gonna just go close to the crown of the plant and cut outwards like this. Now I should be able to pull it down. See, it just pulls right off like that. And that's a good way to do it. You don't wanna like try and pull it like that. A lot of times that'll pull the whole plant out of the pot. Venus flytraps have almost no roots underneath that little bulb. So if you did accidentally pull it out, don't freak out, just stick it back in there and pinch it down tight and it'll probably be just fine. As long as that bulb survived, it's okay. Um, do give us a call if you have any concerns with um, shipping or how the plant showed up. Email us right away with a photo so we can get you taken care of. Don't wait. The more information we have on how it showed up, the better we can help you. But yeah, so we've got it unwrapped and it's looking pretty good. So let's talk about how to keep it that way. All right, so we got it out of the box. We got all that packaging off of here. Now, where are we gonna put this thing? That's probably the most important next step to have success with it. Um, a little bit about transitioning out of the box. So Venus flytraps actually wanna grow in lots and lots of sun. A really warm, sunny place outdoors is best. Like I said before, they're actually temperate plants from North Carolina. So they don't do well in homes. They do way better outside. I'd really encourage you to grow it outside. On the other hand, this flytrap has just traveled in a dark box for 10 days. And you could put it directly out into the sun and you would expect a lot of dieback on all these green lush leaves. They'll die back pretty much to the bulb. That's okay. And if you're brave, it will work out, I promise. 99% of the time, that actually will work out. But it's gonna look really bad for about two or three weeks 
until it starts to grow new leaves out of the center of the plant. You could be more persnickety and avoid that. It's going to take more time and more moves. So you might start off by putting it outside in like filtered light, no direct sun, covered up maybe with like a, a horticultural dome on it or a bell jar. You can't have anything covered in direct sun. It'll cook it almost immediately, even in a cool place. So if you cover it, it's gotta go like in the shade, not too shady, like bright light um, for a day or two and then maybe move it out into a little bit of morning sun and take that lid off. And then after two or three days, move it up into a little bit more sun, a little bit more sun, and you can work it slowly up into more sun. At any point, if you go a little too fast and the leaves crash, that's okay. Again, the other people who are less than persnickety than you, they're having success just putting it out in the sun. So don't freak out if you didn't do this quite right. And it is tricky to do that. Um, nine times out of 10, because I have so many, I just put it out into a sunny spot and let these old leaves burn off and grow new leaves. But I've done it for 30 years, so I've seen that a lot. And I know a lot of you don't want to do that. And so that's why, you know, bag it maybe for the first few days. But it also has to be kind of a brisk process. You can't leave it in the shade for too long. If you leave it in the shade for a week or two, it's going to get even more um, uh, unused to the light. And so the key is briskly moving it up to a nice sunny spot and not staying in the shade too long. But that's a good way to get it acclimatized to your yard. And it should be in your yard. If you have to grow it inside, make sure it's a very sunny windowsill. So light is one of those things that can be kind of tricky to talk about. Lots of people will contact us with like lumens and foot candles. And honestly, I don't have a light meter. I'm a more intuitive gardener than that. And I find over the years when you talk about a sunny spot, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And other plants can be kind of deceptive. So like, I've got a pothos at home and it barely has any access to any direct light. The skylight's open, so it gets a little tiny bit of light for maybe like 30 minutes and it's actually fine with that. Uh, carnivorous plants are not that way. Where they grow in the wild, there's very, uh, very little like trees and shrubs, very little shade because big plants like that aren't competitive in wetlands with poor nutrient soil. And so most carnivorous plants, when I say a sunny spot, I mean a sunny spot. So I usually tell people, you know, could you grow a tomato in that spot? That's what you're looking for. And for those of you who haven't grown a tomato, a tomato would be a tough thing to grow inside. You would need a really cooking, sunny, hot windowsill. So if you have no outdoor space and you want to grow this guy inside, make sure it's a west facing window. You probably want it to get at least four, five, six hours of direct sun. That's probably about the most that you can get inside through a window. It's a very, very sunny spot. Outside in the yard, um, sunny is going to mean a lot of direct sun, but it's usually good if you can cut out some of the afternoon sun in the hottest part of the summer. Even here in California, where our, our summers are relatively mild, we might get up to like 100 degrees occasionally, um, it's good to give them just a little bit of afternoon shade. And if you live somewhere like Arizona, or maybe uh, Orange, Valley, uh, Orange County in Southern California, and it's really hot and it's really dry, sunny for you is gonna be morning sun only with afternoon shade. They could probably even take your full sun, but you're gonna be watering it all the time and it will be like a more compact plant. So you'll have a happier, leafier looking plant with a little less sun in those super sunny areas. So you don't have a very sunny spot like the other people I was talking to, but you still wanna grow Venus flytraps. You can still do it. There are a lot of artificial grow lights on the market now. Thanks to the cannabis industry, that is something that has really super exploded. There's so many of them that honestly, I can't even try them all, but I will say that a T5 fluorescent light, um, probably two to three tubes, uh, it would be a nice light fixture if you wanna go fluorescent. And most of the LED fixtures that we've tried have actually been just great too. There's a cheap flat panel called Yescom that you can buy on Amazon sometimes, and those ones work. Um, but any nice grow light will work. With Venus flytraps, uh, they're temperate plants, and so they still need to go dormant. 
Even if you're growing it in a terrarium, in your desk, under grow lights, if you don't let it go dormant, at least, you know, you know, after two or three years, I should say, they'll probably just die. We get a lot of people who think like, oh, he was lying about that dormancy thing. It's getting bigger and bigger and it's going so great. And it will go great for a few years and then all of a sudden the whole thing will just crash and die. So if you're using artificial lighting, you are still going to have to do something about dormancy. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in our um, dormancy segment of this video. Now let's talk about water. Water quality is a surprising issue. Most of you that killed a carnivorous plant, if you didn't do it by keeping it in a dark corner of your bedroom, you probably did it with your tap water. Now, it will surprise a lot of people, but swamps where the carnivorous plants grow are actually very pristine places. We think of them as kind of muddy, dirty, mosquito places, but actually the water there is very, very pure. And Venus flytraps have evolved in that pure water for millions of years. Now, because of that, all carnivorous plants, but especially Venus flytraps, need uh, water that has zero minerals in it. Now, we get lots of people, because of the fish tank thing, they think that they should set their tap water out for 24 hours in order to get rid of whatever would be hurting the plant. That's actually not true. So with the fish, it's chlorines that hurt them, and those do evaporate within 24 hours. But with the carnivorous plants, it's dissolved solids, dissolved minerals in the water that actually hurts them. Uh, you can test for that with a TDS meter, total dissolved solids, and it will give you a number in parts per million, ppm. We usually tell people that anything below 100 ppm is safe for carnivorous plants, although you will still want to watch for mineral buildup. Um, anything over 150 ppm can be really damaging to Venus flytraps. So if it was a super emergency and it was the difference between letting it dry out or using a little tap water, you could probably use it once or twice. But every time you use water with minerals in it, it's not going anywhere. The water is going to evaporate but the minerals are staying inside. So that creates a thing that we call mineral buildup. And that's another one where customers will think, well, that guy was just persnickety. You, tap water's great on this thing. I've been doing it for months and it's actually great. Again, that'll go okay for a while, but then at a certain point, the minerals are gonna reach 150 and it's gonna start looking really bad. And then all of a sudden it's gonna get 200, 250 a few months later and it's just gonna die. So. Lots of you probably don't have to grow a Venus flytrap forever, and that's totally fine. No judgment. So if you want to use your tap water and feed it some hamburger on your windowsill for a while, there's lots of them now. We make a lot of them here, and that's fine. But if you do want to keep it for a long time, the pure water is absolutely necessary. Pure water can come from a few different places. Rain is still great. So rainwater is fine. If you want to put a rain collection thing outside, maybe you already have one because of the droughts that we've been going through, that water is just fine. Even if it comes off of a dirty roof, even if there's leaves floating in there, even if there's like a frog swimming in there, that's still perfectly fine water for these plants. Now, a reverse osmosis filter is not such a rare thing in households anymore. So if you have a reverse osmosis filter, on the side of your sink, it's usually a little metal faucet that's hooked. You can use that water. Pure or Brita filters actually don't do that much. Don't tell Pure, Pure or Brita that I said that. But if you measure the total dissolved solids on water that is say 150 ppm, and you run that through a Pure sink filter that's right on the end of your sink, it might bring it down to like 140 ppm. So it's doing something for that, but it's not doing enough for carnivorous plants. There is another brand called Zero that I use at home. It's just like the Pure or Brita pitchers, except for the brand is Zero. It comes with a free TDS meter, so you can actually check this. But you put your water in there, and uh, it slowly filters through, and that will actually work just fine. Now, if you want to get your water at the grocery store, avoid things that say purified. That's a word that's been co-opted mostly for the baby market. And so there's a lot of times electrolytes or other minerals and vitamins added to the water for babies. And that's exactly what we're avoiding for these. A careful glance at the ingredients list on that can confirm that. But I like to look for the word distilled. 
distilled always has nothing in it. And it'll be right there with the drinking water, right there with the mineral water, but just make sure it says distilled. Um, and then how to water it. Now, I already said they come from bogs and swamps, so you've probably figured out that they need lots of that water. And they do. Now, Peter came up with the tray method years and years ago, which is a great way of keeping them constantly wet, like a swamp, without having to water them every single day. So choose a nice big saucer. We like these ones. They come from flower shops. They're actually floral liners, but they're extra deep and you can get a nice big wide one because the more water that holds in there, the less often you're gonna have to fill that up. And that is the fun of taking care of plants. Is you have to give them what they need. And so you go out there and you'll check on it every few days and make sure it doesn't dry out. As long as there's some water in there, you're okay. Like that's a nice amount, but if it was all the way to the top for a little while, that's okay too. If you live in the deep south where it's really super hot and humid, you might be able to rot these plants. They're very hard to rot. Here in California, I've never worried about that at all. Even if they were sitting with water on top of them all winter long, they don't rot here. But if you live in a very hot, humid place like that, you may want to keep this water at just about an inch, especially in the winter time. This water can freeze. Like I said before, like if this water freezes in the winter, as long as it doesn't get too cold, and we'll talk about exactly what that means in a second, that's totally fine too. And it's totally getting everything it needs until the tray runs dry. So it's going to soak up everything it needs like a sponge because of the peaty soil even if there's just like a tiny bit of water in the bottom. So don't worry about keeping it up to the tippy top all the time. That's actually not necessary. Now, carnivorous plants can become little ecosystems of their own, especially with water sitting here. Now, lots of you probably had this immediate reaction like, Ugh, I don't want water sitting in my yard. What about mosquitoes? Mosquitoes are a big deal here. All right, it's very rare to get mosquito larvae growing in a tray of water like this unless you're the very best waterer in the world. Usually it's going to dry out in the summertime, probably every two or three days, maybe even every day if it gets really super hot. So it's going to be hard to raise mosquito larvae in there. Now if you do, there's a product called Mosquito Bits and you, they're totally organic. They look like oatmeal. You'll just sprinkle five or six pellets in your tray. It doesn't kill anything except for mosquito larvae and it'll keep it safe for about a month, so it's not a big chore. And also, you may see little tiny worms in there. Don't email me, I don't know what those are. I'm a carnivorous plant expert. You can t I can send me any plant you want, and I'll tell you what it is. But I don't know what the worms are. I do know that they're relatively harmless, and they're not hurting you, and they're not hurting the plant. And any other little frog or creature that you see in there, that's totally fine. Creatures are on the run these days. Let them have a little happy home. So now let's talk a little bit about soil mixes. And before I do, I will say this. If you go asking uh, 10 different plant experts the same question, like what soil do you grow Venus flytraps in? You will find 10 different answers. <laughs> and some of that is because people live in different places and they've modified what they do to their individual areas. Also, um, different growing conditions. So if I have, you know, if my plants are really, really uh, wetter than somebody else's, I might use a soil that has a little bit more aeration in it. So people adjust things to their particular growing condition and their particular area. And as I always say about plants, one of the things I love about it is that it's like an art and a science combined, but it actually doesn't work if there's not a little magic in there too. And that magic part is why everybody else gives a different answer. Now you've come asking me how to grow Venus flytraps, and so I will tell you that for over 30 years, we have grown American pitcher plants, Venus flytraps, which we're talking about today, and even sundews in four parts peat to one part perlite. Now you experienced gardeners, don't put anything good in this. No chicken manure, no compost from the garden, nothing like that. Fertilizer kills carnivorous plants when in really high doses, um, we can use it carefully, and I'll talk about that in a second here, but fertilizer in the soil is not good for carnivorous plants. And for that same reason, avoid miracle Grow as a brand of peat moss and perlite. 
For peat moss, I like Black Gold or Sunshine are both really good brands that you can find throughout the US. And you just want to mix it with your hands and then get it nice and damp. Again, use your good pure water. You can't use tap water on that. You want to set everything up for success. Now, I might as well talk about some other people's magic while we're on the subject. Um, we've also cleared uh, 50 parts peat and sand. We've done that for years. If you want to use, you want, don't want to use sand from the ocean for that because the salts will kill your plants. So um, clay sand is usually good. Sometimes you can find sand usually marketed actually as horticultural sand and that's obviously safe. And the only reason we don't use it anymore is because we ship and to put sand in the pots just costs everyone a lot more money. This is New Zealand sphagnum moss and lots of growers swear by growing their Venus flytraps in this too. I find it a little too open. It has its advantages because, you know, this fibery sphagnum is probably a little bit more antibiotic, a little bit more antifungal than the ground up peat moss. Peat moss is actually just old sphagnum, by the way. But I find that it holds a lot of air. It can dry out faster. And for beginners and, and for us experts too, I still use four parts peat to one part per light. So Venus flytraps are surprisingly much more hardy temperature-wise than most people would think. Now I talked about how they can be a little bit persnickety about their water, so it might be funny to think of them as hardy. But as far as temperature grows, because they're native to North and South Carolina, take it from me, I've been there many times in the summertime, it is very, very hot. A lot of times it'll be 100, 105 degrees with 100% humidity, so it'll feel even hotter than that. And these guys will be outside in the sun just doing great. I'll be dying, sweat pouring off of me, and they'll be just fine with their feet wet sitting in all that heat. So you don't really have to worry about extreme uh, hot temperatures unless it's gonna get maybe like above 105 and you will have to keep it wet all the time. So that can be very challenging if it's hot. So cut yourself a break if it gets really hot and move it into a little less light so that you won't have to water so often. Now, what about the cold? North and South Carolina get pretty cold too. They can get light snow where Venus flytraps grow in the wild, and they can often get nights into the single digits. Um, here in California, where I have the most experience, uh, it probably gets about uh, 25, 20 degrees most winters, and maybe down to 15 once in a while. Now, Venus flytraps do have to protect themselves from that cold somehow, and they are temperate plants, which means dormancy. Dormancy is like hibernation for plants. Bears and squirrels hibernate when it gets cold. Plants go dormant. And you have some experience with this in your day-to-day -day life, like a deciduous tree, an apple tree, a rose bush. Those are plants that go dormant. So when it gets cold, they lose all their leaves and they die back. And Venus flytraps are no different. Um, these guys are actively growing here but in the winter, it would have died back to a few very small, barely functional traps. And it's gonna rely on all the energy it's stored in that bulb to come back next spring. And so that's what dormancy means. So what do you have to do to make it go dormant? Nothing. <laughs> Plants know what time of year it is. And I think lots of our overthinker people really wanna do something to tell it to go dormant. You don't have to. They've been figuring it out for millions of years before there were people. When the day starts to get short, when the night temps start to get cold, it'll know and it'll automatically go dormant. And likewise in the spring, unless you put it in the refrigerator, which we do sometimes, believe it or not, you don't have to do anything special either. Just leave it outside and it'll start to grow when the days get longer and it gets warmer. Now, if you live in a very hot place like Hawaii, or South Florida, you will have to provide dormancy somehow. And we use the fridge method for that. Also, if you live in Michigan or Maine, someplace gets really, really super cold and you don't have a garage that you can keep it, uh, the fridge method is what you want to do. We have a very detailed video about how to do that, and so I just have you go check that out. And there's a lot of other videos too once you go looking. Um, but if you're living in an area where it's not gonna get any colder than 15 degrees at night, which is actually a big chunk of the US, you can just grow this outside all year round. And again, it doesn't matter if the water freezes, that'd be perfectly fine. 
Another thing I'll talk about in regards to winter is a phenomenon called side freeze. That's when a thin plastic pot like this can freeze through the side and kill the bulb. Obviously, the Venus flytraps that are growing in North Carolina aren't doing it in little plastic pots. They're in the continuum of the ground, which keeps them warmer. So if you wanna grow crazy and build a big Venus flytrap bog, and why wouldn't you? You can do that in the yard. You can bury an undrained pot into the ground or use a pond liner, and that will protect it much more than a pot like this over the winter time. And you can even mulch that. They won't need any light. And so you could bury your carnivorous plants, your Venus, fly Venus flytraps over the winter in straw and let the snow sit right on top of that. And believe it or not, that will insulate them. And some carnivorous plants might die over the winter if you do it that way, but probably 90, 95% of the things, temperate plants that you're growing will come right back in the spring. So one of the most fun things about owning a Venus flytrap, and probably half the reason you ordered this thing, is to feed it. So let's talk about that. Probably your grandpa was like, I ordered a Venus flytrap way back in the 60s at Famous Monster Magazine, and we took it home and we fed it a hamburger. You could do that. It's not good for the plant. It's mostly just going to rot that whole trap off. Um, it's better to feed Venus flytraps live prey. They need the constant stimulus in there to know that they've actually caught something. Um, so a dried mealworm is probably not that great. A dead cricket, sometimes they might digest that, but usually they won't. But really the best way to feed a Venus flytrap is live bugs. Um, you can buy mealworms at the pet shop or order them online. Don't feel too bad for them, it has meal right in the name. That's what they're bred for. And you can keep this little tub in the fridge for months and they'll actually stay alive. It's not the best life, but they actually will stay alive. Um, and they're not that gross. A mealworm is uh, on the scale of gross bugs. It's, you know, not that gross. Let's see if we can find one in here. They can get a little squiggly when it gets warm, so that's another good reason to keep them in the fridge. But there's one right here. And so I have this big, beautiful specimen here in front of me. It feels like it'd be a shame not to try and feed one or two of them. I think I'll go for that one right there. And I'll talk a little bit about how they function. So these eyelashes right here on the edge of the trap, they don't do anything to close it. Those little cilia are just there to um, help guide the insect down the middle of the trap. The nectar, and they do have a sweet nectar that lures in the prey, is right on the inside edge of that lip. And so if you're a little fly face, it's hard to get through those bars to get to that nectar. And you have to come in right through the middle. And if you do, you can probably even see there's three red hidden trigger hairs on either side of that leaf. And it is a modified leaf. So in order to make it close, we have to touch two trigger hairs at the same time or one twice quickly, like the double click of a mouse. And that's so it doesn't close on rain or wind in the natural environment, because each trap can only close two or three times. If they closed every time a gust of wind happened or every time a raindrop fell in the middle of that trap, they wouldn't have lasted a very long time at all. Which is probably a good time to talk about fingers, sticks, rocks, and traps. As someone who had one of the largest collections of carnivorous plants, open to the general public for 30 years, I can tell you that nothing is worse for a Venus flytrap than triggering all the traps over and over and over again. It has been a constant battle in my professional career, keeping children's fingers and adults alike out of my beautiful Venus flytraps. And if you want to keep yours for a long time, you'll do that too. You can feed it as much as you want. It's not necessary to feed every single trap, and in fact, it kind of makes the plant unsightly. Every single trap closed will look at kind of small, like a wet dog. So I usually leave a few open and just feed one or two at a time. Even on a big clump like this, you don't have to go through and feed everything, which is good because, you know, that'd be a lot of work. <laughs> so I've got this live mealworm. We're gonna see what kind of a reaction we can get out of this Venus flytrap. Is it hungry? We'll find out. So one and two, kind of hungry. Honestly, it could be a lot faster than that. It has to catch a fly before it flies away, but he's probably a little sleepy today, maybe just a little lazy because he's been hand-fed mealworms his entire life. 
Now that the trap is closed, you can see there are small little holes in between those cilia, those eyelashes, and that's to let a small bug out. So don't go feeding it, like try feeding it ants, although they do catch a lot of ants in the wild, it's a larger ant. So like little Argentinian sugar ants, little fungus gnats, tiny little bugs like that, they're not good for um, catching tiny things like that. So you wanna find like a nice roly poly, an earwig, a wasp, a fly, something with some substantialness to it. Here in the nursery, although I hate that this happens because we love our little frogs, but here in the nursery, they'll even sometimes catch baby frogs and digest them entirely. So they are capable of eating small vertebrates. But don't do that. Don't send me videos of it. Don't post them on Reddit. That's horrible. But mealworms are painless enough, and now it's going to stay closed for about 10 days. And that's how you know it's actually digesting. If it opened right back up the next day on your poor dead cricket, it probably didn't get anything from that cricket. It needs to stay close and become very, very tight together. And it's gonna start putting acids and enzymes in between the two lobes of that leaf, just like our stomachs digest our food. And it's gonna break down the soft parts of that mealworm and other glands inside the trap are gonna suck up all the fertilizer that the Venus flytrap needs. And they do need it. We get a lot of questions. Do Venus flytraps actually need to eat? Yes, they do. Um, they're not like a dog, so if you don't feed it every week, it's not like it's gonna starve and die or something like that. Actually, I think you're supposed to feed dogs once a day. But the more you feed it, the better it will do. You can tell around here, like if you see a big, beautiful Venus flytrap, it almost always has an old, big insect exoskeleton in there. And the exoskeleton, the hard outside of bugs, it's hard to digest, so don't expect that to go away. It'll reopen and it will still have the little worm pajamas in there. And you don't have to take that out either. Don't mess with it. So doing this a long time. And in fact, bugs are dumb. So the yellow jackets, the spiders, the predatory bugs are gonna see that dried husk of whatever it caught. And a lot of times they'll try to get that out and they'll be the second prey of a Venus flytrap trap. There's also fertilizing. So what if you don't wanna to touch bugs? And even I, at this point in my life, have become kind of soft, and I don't really love putting poor live mealworms into these Venus fly traps all day long. So, they're fertilizer they're trying to catch, and you can fertilize them gently. This is Maxi Fertilizer. We, smell, we sell these small tubs online at our nursery. Um, and if you just have a couple Venus fly traps, you probably only need a small tub like this. You can sometimes find it at um, stores locally, but it's not all over the whole world, so we do ship it. Um, don't use a lot of this. Less is more. So you want to do one quarter teaspoon per gallon of water and just lightly sprinkle your plants with that about once every two weeks tops. Once a month is just fine. It won't be as good as feeding them live bugs, but it will definitely keep them alive. And if you have a plant like Biohazard or any of those really mutated weird Venus flytraps, and I know some of you like the weird mutated Venus flytraps, those ones can't really eat bugs, and so you will have to fertilize them. Another good reason to use fertilizer is on baby Venus flytraps. Now, growing Venus flytraps from seed is a very tricky thing to do, actually. It probably not shouldn't be your first Venus flytrap experience, but it is very rewarding and fun. And here we grow new ones all the time, and that's how we make brand new, cool, giant, dark red, all kinds of new cultivars of Venus flytraps. And one of my favorite things is growing them from seed. Now, it used to, we used to tell people it would take six, seven, eight years to grow a Venus flytrap to maturity from seed. And that's true if you never ever feed it or fertilize it. But we can speed that up quite a bit if we fertilize. When a Venus flytrap grows, it'll have a tiny, tiny little trap that you probably couldn't get anything into. And even if you did, it would barely work. So a foliar feeding of maxi fertilizer once a month will take years off of growing them. Be light with this though. The more you fertilize, the more you're gonna encourage moss, algae, and other things to grow. They like this fertilizer too. So less is more. Don't start doing it every single week. Don't go back and do it again just when you did in the morning. Less is more. And we do get a lot of people that wanna do a lot with their plants. It's good to be nurturing and you do wanna take care of them, but they're also meant to mostly be left alone. So if you find yourself touching this thing more than five or six times a day, if you find yourself looking at it like this, probably take a couple feet back and visit, check on it a couple less times. I know they're fun to look at, but you can definitely overthink, overtouch these plants. 
to flower or not to flower. Now, Peter's always told every single person ever to cut Venus flytrap flowers off. And some of you may be thinking, oh my God, Venus flytraps have flowers? They seem like they're from space. Where do these things come from? They do have flowers. All carnivorous plants flower to make seeds, and that's how they reproduce. And you can see, here's a flower stalk right here. Now, Venus flytraps, like I said before, they go dormant in the winter. And the first thing they do when they wake up if they're, going, if they're going to do this, is flower. Um, it can take a long time to get a Venus flytrap up to flowering size, especially if you start with a seed. Like I said, it can usually take like six, seven years to get your first flower if you're growing a Venus flytrap and seed. So if you bought it this year, don't be shocked if it doesn't bloom next year. It might be the year after. Um, the flowers are white and kind of pretty. They do come up first to avoid this kind of problem of how is it that you catch bugs to live but then also need bugs to pollinate your flowers. So the traps themselves are red and down low, and the flowers are up high and white. So we reckon that whatever is attracted to the traps is attracted to that red color, and whatever is attracted to the flowers is attracted to that white. So they're probably two different things for the most part. They also distance themselves like temporarily, which and what I mean by that is the flowers come up first. This is actually a dormant Venus fly trap. As nice as it looks, I mean it has nice traps on there, but this will be three times, four times bigger in a couple months when it starts to grow. So it's just started off with this flower like that. And you can see there's not that many traps on there to eat the poor bugs that are trying to do the pollination. And the flowers only open up for one single day. And they only probably make flowers, I would say, mostly around the month of March and April. And then they'll be completely done with that. Um, it does take a lot of energy out of the plant to let this flowering happen. I always tell people that flowering is the most energy expensive thing that a plant ever does. And I usually liken it to pregnancy for a woman. It takes a lot out of the plant. And for some small plants, there is such a phenomenon as the bloom and die. So if you had a Venus flytrap on your windowsill that wasn't getting enough light and it was really super struggling, a lot of people will contact us and be like, I think it's doing great though, you guys, because there's a flower coming. It might be doing great. It also might be doing a phenomenon which is a bloom and die. So plants, their, their whole programming is about making the next generation just like us. And if they feel like, I might be dead in another year here, they're gonna flower and try and make some seeds to try and you know, keep things going. So if you have a weak plant and it's going to flower, cut that off right away. Flowering is for healthy, big, old, established, beautiful plants. And again, this flower probably took the place of six or seven beautiful traps. And so if you'd rather have those traps, cut it off when it looks like a tiny little asparagus just shooting up out of the center of the plant. And you can just pinch it off with your nails or scissors. A weird fun fact, Venus flytrap sap will stain your skin black. And so when I go around and pinch all these flower stalks off in the spring, I get this weird black spot on my thumb, which is just a weird professional thing that you'd actually probably never know about if you didn't do that a lot. Now we make all of our own seeds here to sell to you guys. And so we let all of our Venus flytraps flower and then we pollinate them, moving pollen from one flower to the female part of another. And then if we do that successfully, a little seed pod will form in between these sepals, that's not it, but it'll form right there. It looks like kind of like a little black pouch, papery, and then that will peel away, and inside will be a few, maybe 10 to 20, small seeds that are very shiny and black. And that's what Venus flytrap seeds look like. I take this moment to warn against ordering Venus flytrap seeds from anywhere but California carnivores or maybe the ICPS, the International Carnivorous Plant Seed Bank, is a good reputable source for seeds. But if you bought them on Etsy, if you bought them on eBay, there's a really good chance that you bought wheat seeds or dragon fruit seeds or sunflower seeds. They're very, very rarely Venus flytrap seeds. And the next public service announcement, there are no such thing as blue Venus flytraps. You will see blue Venus flytrap seeds being sold on eBay as blue as Daniela's hair. That does not exist. If it did, I'd be the first one to have a big giant one here to show you. Don't buy blue Venus flytrap seeds. Um, but yeah, so you can let them flower to make some seeds if you want to try that. And that can be a really fun and rewarding experience. But mostly, we always recommend cutting off your flowers. 
Now I'd like to talk a little bit about when to pot Venus flytraps and what kind of pots to use, because that is important. So you could repot a Venus flytrap at virtually any time of the year with some success. But plants are all about timing and seasons. And so the best time to repot a Venus flytrap would be in the late winter, early spring. You want them to still be mostly dormant, but just right on the edge of ready to wake up for the beautiful springtime. Spring is the best time for a temperate plant. And so if you're gonna have to go through, there will be some transplanting shock no matter when you do this. But if you do it uh, late winter, early spring, right before things are waking up, there will be almost none because there's almost no leaves on there to evaporate all the water. Even if you damage all the roots, that bulb is very safe. It's really hard to mess things up that time of year. Now we're a full production facility, so I can say for sure that we pot up Venus flytraps all year round. If you do it in the summer, like I think I hinted earlier, if you pot up or bare root a Venus flytrap late summer or in the fall, it's probably not gonna do anything until the very next spring. A traumatic, a traumatic event like that right before dormancy often triggers dormancy. Um, and in fact, if you order the plant in around Halloween or something like that, don't be shocked if it immediately goes into dormancy because of that transfer. But whenever a plant, a temper plant, um, hits on hard times, it just goes dormant. So always transplant them around February or March if you can. Don't use terracotta pots. Peter disavowed terracotta pots a long, long time ago. Obviously in Victorian times, they had to use terracotta pots to grow their Venus flytraps, and so it can be done with frequent transplanting, but why? There's so many good options now. Plastic is great. Um, glazed ceramic planters are great. If there's a glaze on there, that means there was a hard fire and there won't be any leaching of minerals. Versus terracotta, any of you who've used a terracotta pot have seen that white uh, exudate that starts to build up on the outside of the pot and the inside. You don't see it, but it's building up on the inside. Those are salts, and that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Also avoid anything metal. Peat moss is very acidic. It's a pH about four or five, and it will eat metal like the ocean. So no copper planters, and as it eats that up, it's going to turn it into salts and minerals that again will kill your plants. So avoid anything like that. You can use things like wood planters or kind of funky planters like that that you find. Um, but for the most part, plastic's probably best. Do find something with holes in the bottom of the pot. That way it can absorb the water from its watering tray. You can grow them in undrained pots because they are swamp plants, but that makes watering very tricky. So I don't recommend that unless you're a very persnickety gardener because there won't be anywhere for it to store the water and you'll have to water it very frequently. Um, and be very firm when you're potting things up. We're gonna do a more um, detailed video in a second here um, when I break up this big, beautiful specimen. When they get full and giant like this, what you're actually looking at isn't one Venus flytrap anymore. There's probably 20 or 30 different Venus flytrap bulbs in there. And if we spread them all apart, those 20 or 30, they'll multiply individually into three or five again. And so that's how you can end up with the big, beautiful Venus flytrap bulbs that I'm so well known for. I did that just by starting off with one, and then over the winter, it became three and five, and I moved it up into a six inch pot. And those became three and five. And that's how I ended up with those big bowls that you always see me photograph for that I know lots of you guys are really jonesing for. It's best probably to repot your Venus flytrap every single year. I know that seems a little bit crazy, but in nature, they have a fire cycle. They actually really like to burn in the wild, and repotting them is about as close as we can get to that. And so, in the wild, they would love to burn every year. And although it can be kind of labor intensive, especially if you have a large collection, it's best to repot every single year. Now, here at California Carnivores, I do have a large collection. So honestly, I don't do it every single year. That'd be a big waste of peat moss and labor. We can do it every two or three years probably. And if you're a good grower, that's okay. But lots of people do repot them every single year. One of our mottos here at California Carnivores and one of our firm philosophies has always been conservation through cultivation. One of the big reasons that I spent my entire life growing these plants is to protect them and keep them even as they're being destroyed in the wild. I'm so in love with them. 
I've, uh, they're just so beautiful. They've been around for millions of years. Charles Darwin called this the most you know, fascinating plant ever evolved. And it would be so horrible if we as Americans destroyed this plant forever. So that's why I take the time to do these videos and educate people about that. And also why I built this entire nursery where we keep as an ARC project all of these plants safe with location data if we have them in the hopes that even if someday they're never able to be put back in the wild, we still have them. Zoos are keeping tigers and pandas. I've been working on keeping these. Now another aspect of that is making sure that you guys get a really great plant that wasn't dug up out of the wild. If you did order a Venus flytrap from Famous Monsters magazine in the 60s, it was almost certainly dug out of the wild. And even most of the nurseries that were operating in like the 70s were still just digging them out of the wild. And unfortunately, even today, although it has been recently made a felony to poach Venus flytraps out of the swamps of North and South Carolina, people still do that now. So we've always believed that in supplying the general public with plants that are affordable and grown here at California carnivores, never ever taken out of the wild, that is gonna relieve poaching pressure because the average guy isn't gonna go wander off into the mosquito-ridden alligator green swamp of North Carolina to go dig up Venus flytraps that he can only sell for a few dollars. And so we always source our Venus flytraps um, ethically. We sometimes buy from other vendors who grow them there, but we have our own tissue culture lab where we clone these Venus flytraps in jars and we're able to make thousands of them that way without ever touching wild populations. And I would touch a little bit, you know, we've bred and bred all kinds of amazing new Venus flytrap cultivars here. And other people are doing that all over the world. And when I was a little boy, there was just the typical wild grown Venus flytrap variety. Nothing special, nothing big, nothing red, nothing toothy. Dente was the first Venus flytrap cultivar that came out in the 90s. Leo Song, I think, came out with that. And then in the late 90s, Red Dragon and Green Dragon were the first two all red Venus flytraps um, that were named by Ron Gagliardo. And now there are hundreds of different kinds of Venus flytraps. And they're all honestly more interesting than the wild ones. If you go in the wild, you know, lots of people have a penchant for a plant that was collected out of the wild. And the truth is, you're skipping out on decades of plant breeding. We've been breeding Venus flytraps here to make them better and better and better and more vigorous and easier to grow and used to cultivation than those wild plants. That wild plant is just like a feral cat that you brought into your house. It's not used to that. These plants have been raised for decades. This is a variety called B52 one of the giant varieties that came out almost 20 years ago. And there's no reason to grow a wild collected Venus flytrap when you could be growing a B52 or even my big giant one, Ginormous. Those are just way better flytraps, more vigorous, more rewarding. They're gonna grow a lot faster. And so I would encourage you, some of you, to let go of that penchant for wild collected plants. That's the kind of thing that fuels poaching. But just to be really super clear, because we get asked all the time, because everyone's telling you, make sure you find ethically sourced Venus flytraps. We are ethically sourced. It would kill me if we ever did anything that hurt these amazing plants. So now I think I have you guys hooked on Venus flytraps, but I do have more information on our YouTube channel. We have a whole playlist on Venus flytraps. So if you're excited by this rabbit hole, anywhere I go start digging deeper, Go check that out and you can learn all about them. Another thing, there's actually so many more carnivorous plants. That's how I've been able to waste my entire life away on these plants. There are actually almost a thousand different species of carnivorous plants in the wild. I think 17 different genera. There are so many different kinds of carnivorous plants. So this is a big rabbit hole. <laughs> it might take you all night, it might take you a few days, but we have a lot of YouTube videos and there's a lot more on the way. So make sure you subscribe to make sure you get our great content if you have any more questions, we're answering those all the time. So throw those down in the comments. It helps us make better videos. And ultimately, we're just trying to teach you guys how to grow beautiful plants like this, just like I have for my entire life.